Welcome to the Xterra Podcast. The Xterra mission is to explore and discuss the business of space and its effect on the national and global economy, as well as life on Earth. How does what happens in space affect your life every day? That's what we're exploring on the Xterra website, as well as on this podcast. My guest today is Courtney Stadt, founder and president of Capital Alliance Solutions. Courtney, thanks for joining me. My pleasure, Tom. Thanks for inviting me. Let's talk a little bit first about your background. Uh, what have you been doing for the, your entire life? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I got uh, involved with, with the whole commercial space domain about uh, 40 years ago. Um, I'd like to say when Elon Musk was still in Knickers uh, in elementary school, uh, I got the bug. And I originally was um, enamored with the Foreign Service, um, but um, Vietnam was um, uh, resulting in a lot of attrition in the Foreign Service. And for lots of reasons, it, it was not really, for me at the time, the right career path. And I ran into uh, a few mentors at the time in, in, in my college, and one thing led to another, and I got introduced to the late, great Jerry, uh, Gerard K. O'Neill, famous for his uh, space colony concept back in the uh, late 70s, 80s. And I was off to uh, space. So I've spent 40 years in the nonprofit advocacy in the government, White House, uh, Department of Commerce, uh, where I helped co-found the Office of Space Commerce. I was an early director of the uh, office of the FAA that licenses uh, private rockets uh, like Elon Musk, SpaceX, and Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin, and so forth. A um, couple of stints at NASA and then in the industry have been lucky enough to be uh, involved with a number of Pathfinder industries from global positioning, satellite, uh, uh, Trimble Navigation was really a pioneer in that whole area, remote sensing in one of the uh, original companies called Earthwatch, now part of Digital Globe, which is in turn part of uh, Maxar, and uh, a number of different launch companies, satellite companies. and um, here I am in, in the consulting business with Capital Alliance Solutions. Which is a perfect segue. What is Capital Alliance Solutions? What do you do? And who are your typical clients? Boutique uh, uh, management consulting firm. It's uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, it came about because, frankly, uh, during my stints in, in industry and, and in government, um, I realized that there was an overabundance of government relations types that, to be brutally honest, um, seem to be more focused on uh, the relations, the process, and we're a uh, big cost in meeting time sinks. And I saw a, an opportunity uh, in the 90s for a company that would focus on solutions, on working with clients to help their bottom line. And the combination of my government experience, and again, I was fortunate working for uh, cabinet secretaries and several NASA administrators uh, in the office of the president. Um, I was able to combine that experience with my private sector experience and offer um, an experience and skill base to help the entrepreneur navigate the perilous waters of, of the federal bureaucracy, both in terms of policy, regulatory challenges, as well as seeking uh, seed capital uh, to act as a facilitator or catalyst for, uh, for uh, uh, commercial space companies. So that is essentially what the Capital Line Solutions is all about. So without being specific, unless you want to, what, who are your typical clients at this point? Well, over the years, I've worked with everybody from the, the giants like the Lockheeds and, and, and the Boeings um, who were looking to put a limb or, or so, or at least a toe, in the proverbial commercial space waters uh, to the startups out there. And um, today I'm primarily focused on, on sort of the, the Pathfinder entrepreneurial type. So um, I work with a, a gentleman in Texas who has come up with a very innovative, low cost buoyancy training tank for not only astronauts, but for wannabe space travelers. And uh, between his engineering and his Hollywood experience, he's come up with this 
fascinating uh, tank that can scale from two to 20 people that has rear projection. So when you're floating in, in, the, in the tank, you actually have the earth orbiting underneath. And experts have said it's about as close as you can get to the sense of, um, of, of spacewalking in, in earth orbit. Uh, he's also been involved with designing and, and building low cost uh, uh, space helmet and suit. So I'm helping him in the marketing of, of those technologies. Um, to a company that um, uh, called Tip Technologies, uh, it's a software company. And Tom, we support about 85% of the aerospace company, more and more commercial space in the quality assurance reliability world. And mm. to say the least, uh, in a business where um, the tolerances for uh, uh, reliability are very narrow in the spacecraft business, uh, there's a real need for it for our software. And so I help them with their marketing and business development. And we're penetrating more and more of the, of the commercial space uh, market world. Um, and I'm working with a, a company that's on the leading edge of optical communications. And for the Star Trek and the Expanse science fiction fans among your audience, uh, may I remind you all that um, uh, Kirk and team are actually using optical laser-based communications. Um, so the company I'm working with called Laser Light Communications um, will actually be building the first dedicated uh, laser satellites in Earth orbit. We hope to deploy in the next two to three years. And we have a sister company called Com. Star, if you're interested, C O M M S T A R dot space, um, that will be the first commercial driven, uh, truly telecom uh, network as CIS Lunar. So it will provide both optical and uh, radio frequency RF um, for uh, the dozen or so commercial lunar robots that are being planned as well as uh, the Artemis uh, uh, crude uh, program that NASA is undertaking as well. And for those of us of a certain generation, Tom, that remember the flickering black and white images of Neil Armstrong and Buzz oh, yes. uh, Aldrin <laughs> uh, on the moon, um, optical has such high fidelity and throughput that you can be guaranteed very, very high definition uh, color imagery, uh, video and, and so forth. Uh, um, of future uh, activities on, on the moon and beyond. And one other comment, uh, what's exciting is that in a sense, we're building uh, the Wi-Fi, the sort of the, the beginnings of a Wi-Fi between earth to moon, that lays the foundation for moon and beyond, Mars or, or, or whatever. So, and I'm also working um, with, a, with a spaceport um, and work with the spaceport community, commercial spaceports uh, generally, um, as part of my uh, membership of, of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. Um, and that's exciting too, to, to see those spaceports begin to uh, get some traction. Do you need to take a different approach when you work with a company like a Boeing or a Lockheed and some of these smaller startup companies that are your clients? Night and day, the, uh, these larger companies have, uh, a, you know, a, a, almost a cast of Ben-Hur army of lobbyists and, and, and people who are, uh, expert at block and tackling with, with the government. Uh, almost invariably with the smaller companies, uh, you have um, people who are new to interacting with the government. In many cases, uh, they're very strong technically. You end up often with engineers that have uh, no shortage of, of really innovative ideas, but they um, have a dearth of, of uh, knowledge in terms of, of execution and working again, with, uh, with the government and trying to figure out a way to uh, um, get the, the support out of the government, both policy and, 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 and funding wise. And, and let me say very quickly that um, I'm a commercial guy and I feel much more comfortable working in the business world. And I can tell you that I've worked with a number of clients who are card carrying libertarians, disdain any involvement with the United States government and invariably realize that um, NASA and the Pentagon still remain in the year 2021, uh, the proverbial 800 pound gorillas. 
And um, although I'm pleased to see that more and more the commercial industry is, is driving and shaping, the fact is that NASA is a 20 some odd billion dollar uh, behemoth and, and the Pentagon, if you include the intelligence community is probably 50 billion plus. So um, you really cannot succeed in this business today uh, without some relationship for better or for worse uh, with, with, the, uh, with the government. And, and even though people think about the government as being very slow moving, they, they are innovators and they license out a lot of technology that these smaller companies are then taking and improving, using for their own products, which might not be available if the government didn't create them in the first place. That is, that is correct. Um, and you will always have friction between um, the entrepreneur and, and the federal bureaucrat. Um, time is of the essence, time is money. We all know the cliche in the business world. Um, bureaucrats operate according to a different time frame, right? And often you end up with uh, sometimes frustrations. The good news is that slowly, sometimes agonizingly slowly, but surely we're seeing um, leadership in both the Pentagon and, and, and NASA who are uh, implementing different initiatives to try to speed up the process of encouraging commercial space. So you have pitch days from the Air Force where literally millions of dollars worth of procurements decisions are made um, right on the spot. Um, that was unheard of just a, a few short years ago. Uh, there's something called the Space Enterprise Consortium which is under the auspices of, of the Air Force, which has several hundred members, mostly entrepreneurs, as well as some of the large contractors that uh, form a, a group that ensures that, um, or at least maximizes uh, the chances that the uh, Air Force will be aware of some of the cutting edge technologies that then will allow uh, their acquisition experts to try to figure out a way to get access to those. Um, NASA is trying in its various ways to uh, reach out and, and stay on top of, of, of latest developments and, and trying to develop uh, more innovative and quicker ways to tap into the expertise that's out there. But I don't want to kid you listeners uh, that uh, it's still a um, uh, two or three yards forward with a couple yards backwards in terms of uh, ensuring that there is a smooth uh, uh, forward-looking relationship between the federal government and, and the industry, but it's far better than when I first started 40 years ago. So then, Courtney, what are some of the biggest challenges you encounter when you're working with e either a major company or a small company? Well, um, in the instance of, of the smaller company, it's often trying to get the leadership of that company out of its own way. Um, they often feel that they're the smartest people uh, on the block and uh, they really sometimes need to take a, a deep breath and understand that uh, there've been other people who've tread the same path. Let's look at some lessons learned. Um, government is the way it is, you're not gonna change it. So they have to be educated as to how best to present their opportunity or their challenges to a given, a given agency or, or official. Um, and um, I think with the larger companies, it's uh, also, in a sense, getting out of their own way. They're, they're accustomed to sort of long sales cycles. They're accustomed to uh, developing expertise on the very traditional procurement cycles. And now suddenly these upstarts come into their neighborhood that they've dominated for so long um, with uh, leading edge technology and uh, venture capital to some extent, and are looking for much quicker turnaround solutions. Um, and frankly, uh, it was one of the reasons why uh, uh, traditional companies were caught off guard by Elon Musk and SpaceX. They were caught up with an old paradigm in terms of, of expecting that they could get these cost plus contracts uh, with nice margins uh, with the government. And it became almost a, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, just depending on the, on, on the public uh, trough, 
and this upstart uh, Elon Musk rolls in and says, no, I can actually provide this capability for some fraction of the cost, do it faster. Um, and it took, uh, shall we say, some trauma and some lawsuits uh, by Elon, his trademark, uh, to where we are today. And if I may make one other comment, Tom, sure. um, those of us of a generation who remember Space Odyssey 2001 that came out, I think in 1968, 69, that time period, fully expected that we'd be having this conversation, Tom, on the moon. Um, mm -hmm. You and I will have traveled by uh, Pan Am, dating myself. I don't know how many of your <laughs> listeners remember there was a Pan Am. There was. But in the movie, Pan Am was taking us to the moon, and, and we were, uh, of course, communicating with our fellow Earthlings uh, through a video phone at the time. Um, none of us thought that we would be where we are today, which is still essentially climbing out of the gravity well, at least Earth orbit, and with hopes, hopes that we can uh, reclaim uh, the moon, uh, hopefully in the next uh, several years. Um, and I think a large part of that was because the government had such a monopsony on the space domain for almost a half a century. The great news is that over the past generation, in particular the last 10 years, uh, we've seen this incredible proliferation of American entrepreneurship. And um, we can talk as you wish a few moments about what the prospects of that uh, new domain is, that primarily entrepreneurial driven domain. Um, but it's very exciting. But uh, we're having to make up, many of us in my generation feel like we're making up for lost time. I'm talking with Courtney Statt, founder and president of Capital Alliance Solutions on the Xterra podcast. Take a moment right now to click on subscribe and be sure you don't miss any of the podcasts or if you're watching on YouTube, any of the videos from Xterra, the Journal of Space Commerce. Courtney, what kinds of issues arise from the continual back and forth swinging of the political pendulum? Well, um, for years, a change of administration would often mean a change in priorities in terms of the future of, of the uh, spaceflight. Um, some administrations talked about Mars, some suddenly shift to the moon. Uh, there are various priorities vis-a-vis -vis the International Space Station. The good news for many of us who've been in this business a long time is continuity. And I, I must uh, give some uh, credit to the current administration, the Biden administration, that essentially they're building off of the groundwork that the previous administration had laid uh, for returning to the moon and for a long range mission to Mars, um, as well as focused on turning as much of the low earth orbit uh, of Earth uh, to the private sector. So those elements are very much continuing in, in place. And if your audience will allow a little bit of inside Beltway discussion, the appropriators on the Hill um, are doing their bit as well. They, they actually are being pretty generous given all the challenges that the United States is facing in terms of supporting uh, the NASA budget overall, which is ensuring continuity in terms of public-private partnerships with commercial space. Um, I would say a lot of the challenges really are in execution. So my old office, now run by General Wayne Monteith um, at the FAA, um, on the one hand gets kudos for making attempts to streamline the process um, of issuing licenses to the uh, private rocket business. Uh, but there's still a lot of um, uncertainty as to uh, questions involving liability issues um, in terms of speed of decision making as more and more rocket activity is, is taking place, um, ensuring that, that, that they have the resources and the bandwidth, uh, that those are big uncertainties right now. Um, and uh, I would say remote sensing, which is uh, really opening up uh, 
a company called Planet, which is known for its constellation of doves, is now announced that they're going to go down to 50 centimeters. Uh, so you're slowly but surely edging into intelligence, high resolution uh, domain, not quite there yet, but you're edging toward. So how will the government respond to licensing those sorts of capabilities in the private sector? So very interesting. Um, those are just two or three random walks through some of the challenges that we're, we're facing. I do want to make a quick comment, which is that um, I've devoted my life to this commercial space world, and I'm very excited by what we're seeing. Uh, just 24 hours ago, uh, Captain Kirk actually hosed me an Admiral Kirk. I know he got <laughs> demoted uh, in, in one of the, the last Star Treks, but he's always an Admiral to me. And I, I think the idea that we could take a 90 year old man to uh, the edge of space is sort of an, an amazing thing to have witnessed, let alone his, his wonderfully uh, emotional reaction to it. But um, uh, there's gotta be a lot of um, churn and, and, and we are witnessing a lot of froth consolidations, expect failures, expect bankruptcies. This, this attends on any emergent major new industry. And we're still in a, a situation where, where um, um, companies are still looking for the so-called killer app, still looking for how can we really make a profit? So even companies like Rocket Lab that are achieving a, a nice cadence in terms of launches, even they acknowledge it's going to be several years so they can make back the non-recurring investment. To get into the rocket business, it turns out it's about, a, in today's dollars, about a $250, $300 million price tag. And it seems to be taking about a decade or more uh, for companies uh, on average to, to get traction. So for the small investor out there, um, unless you've got some mad money and want to ride a few of these uh, uh, high valuation companies, I, I would uh, keep your money in your pocket. It's not for the faint hearted. Uh, we're going to have quite a roller coaster ahead of us. Uh, but long term, I, I do remain very optimistic. Um, but other point, Tom, we're not alone on this. So China is moving very rapidly. Um, and I'm joined with those who say that I would be far more comfortable, of course, having American led enterprise with our values uh, versus the auto autocratic um, centralized uh, system of, of uh, today's China. Um, so in, in some ways it's a, uh, a race that's, I would argue as insidious and even more sophisticated than the one that I grew up in the Cold War with, with the Russians. Uh, that is the one with China is particularly uh, concerning. I want to come back to the FAA for just a minute because the congressional sure. mandate of the minimal regulation for the space commerce industry is scheduled to sunset in a couple of years. What do you see as the major changes that will come about as a result of that regulation sunsetting? Well, it's a very good question. The industry at large would like the FAA to continue to hold off a couple more years. The FAA leadership is saying, we don't think we have the luxury to do that because if, Lord forbid, we have a disaster, and I do remind your listeners that uh, you're still strapping people onto a controlled explosive, and the tolerances between uh, life and death are, are still pretty narrow with these rocket ventures, um, that the FAA would like to get ahead of, uh, of such a possible disaster and at least show the oversight committees on the Hill, um, the White House, that they're being proactive and they're at least putting in some basic protections, safety measures. Um, I personally believe that, that, that the government weighing in is inevitable. Um, I always get concerned about the heavy handed nature of, of the federal government, but I think in this instance, what I see emerging as a, as a healthy partnership dynamic. And uh, I think we're gonna see over the next couple of years, some, some basic regulatory framework. Um, 
this is still the Wild West. And mm-hmm. remember when a, uh, Shatner is strapped into, well, I got to call him Admiral Kirk. When he is strapped into that <laughs> Blue Origin spacecraft yesterday, he no doubt signed a number of waivers. So in the event of catastrophe, uh, Jeff Bezos and, and Blue were off the hook as much as possible. Uh, that piece of paper is useless because you basically don't have the, uh, the, the case law behind it. And we live, unfortunately, in a very litigious society. So at some point, somebody will inevitably sue uh, one of these companies. And then uh, we, we have the judiciary begin to weigh in and begin to build up the case study, the case law. Um, so the, the, the legislature is going to weigh in, the federal regulators, regulators are going to weigh in, and the courts are going to weigh in over time, whether we like it or not. Um, so we might as well engage sooner so that the industry can do its best to educate the regulators and the members of Congress sooner than later. And we try to hold hands together and, and work it through as best as possible. Um, so that, that's my sense of where we are, Tom. You mentioned uh, a new space race uh, between perhaps the United States and China, but there's also a commercial space race. It's, you know, Musk versus Bezos versus uh, 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 Richard Branson. What are the problems and opportunities you foresee in both the geopolitical space race and the commercial space race? Well, I think from starting with the geopolitical and, and particularly with China, because China has the funds, uh, it has the labor force, it has the scientific and engineering leadership uh, dedicated to space. So uh, if, you, if your listeners have not been tracking, China has a mini space station, but a space station and their astronauts called Taikonauts um, are inhabiting those space stations. They have landed robots on the moon uh, particularly on the South Pole, which we have yet to do. Um, it doesn't take reading Art of War to know that if you're at the top of the mountain peering down, it gives you a strategic advantage, which means that the China, China today, if you will, is peering down at, at our satellites up at geosynchronous, about 23 miles roughly up in, in 23,000 miles in orbit, where we have uh, a number of our key intelligence assets. So that's making our military uncomfortable. I know there are many who uh, would hope that we could avoid militarizing space. Uh, I do, I wish that as well, but those of us familiar with the human comedy know that uh, when it comes to uh, humanity anywhere, uh, the beautiful comes along with the, the bad and the ugly. And uh, uh, I, I regret to say it, but I think there is gonna need, is a need for uh, some level of military defense uh, in orbit, in in space. Um, And as we hopefully see more and more commercial uh, companies establishing themselves on the moon, let's say, for example, if it turns out that it's profitable to mine resources on the moon, um, they'll need some level of protection, uh, arguably, um, as an example. So I think that you're going to see more and more um, of of the Defense Department in one form or another uh, in space, both robotically and eventually uh, even crewed uh, missions, even though the Space Force denies it today. I I just think that we're going to end up there. Um, China has a very, very ambitious 50-year-plus plan for occupying uh, not only near Earth and the Moon and Mars, uh, but basically taking a dominant position in the solar system. I'd like to think that we could form some level of cooperation with them as we did ultimately with the Russians at one point, uh, but the jury's out on that. Um, and it, my sense is that the, the current president, Che of China, is more interested in uh, dominance than he is in, in cooperation, but we shall see. Commercial front, um, I know the media likes to play up the uh, ego a uh, race between Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. By the way, I think it's real. I, I do think that they do regard 
each other with a certain level of disdain. Um, I uh, will say this. I know that some members of Congress have viewed this sort of billionaire driven race that we're seeing, if you will, with uh, Sir Branson and Elon and, and Jeff Bezos as a sort of a vanity project. Um, right. And I think that demonstrates lack of imagination. Um, I think what we're witnessing, sure, you can, you can have ego and when's, when is ego not driven? Uh, wealth creation and, and, and entrepreneurs, uh, the Andrew Carnegie's, the Rockefellers, you name it, JP Morgan. Um, but you can also have ego drive and yet also have social benefit at the same time. We actually are capable of doing both at the same time. And I, I think what you're seeing with these initial launches from Blue and Virgin, obviously with, with SpaceX, is breaking the barrier between the government monopoly and opening it up. Yes, to the elites for the moment, the price of admission still remains very high, but we're seeing a greater variety of people uh, from the civilian professions go to space just in the last several months. And so to me, we're beginning to see slowly but surely the opening up of the frontier and the price points, which range from a half a million uh, per seat today, could, I can envision uh, that opening up to uh, 100,000 and beginning to get to an area where at least um, upper middle class becomes something one, one can think about. Uh, the, the big issue for me is how many people are willing to step up, how many extreme adventurers are willing to get in that rocket be strapped on a on that ex controlled explosive and go to orbit. That's an open question, um, but I do think that there's so many advancements in robotics and uh, artificial intelligence and, and so forth that are combining to create very interesting uh, space-based uh, communications and, and imagery and manufacturing in space that I think the statistical odds are that we will find that profit-making opportunity that, that, that still remains elusive today at some point. Um, so I, I, I remain long-term optimist with a warning, a red alert that we're gonna be seeing the types of stumbles and, and uh, consolidations and bankruptcies that are often associated with the birthing of, of new, uh, new industries. One final comment, Tom. Um, people always seek to compare this emerging space domain to the aircraft industry and, 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 and computers and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, again, as passionate as I am, as enthusiastic as I am, going into space is an orders of magnitude, different set of challenges. It is hostile to humans, so anytime you put a human into this vacuum of space and, and these extraordinary ranges of, uh, of, of uh, you know, breathtaking temperatures, both cold and, and hot, um, the systems required to keep people alive, dealing with radiation and so forth are formidable. We will figure out solutions, but that's gonna take time as we also figure out whether from a commercial standpoint, there are self-sustaining enterprises out there. So what's exciting, particularly among the young people today that might be listening to us, is that literally you can write your ticket today. Um, and I keep telling young people that regardless of your, you could be non-technical and find uh, an area from uh, marketing to business development to uh, engineers and physicists, scientists, it's an amazing frontier that's that's opening up uh, at, at almost hyper velocity as we uh, as, as we speak. Every day, I open up the the trade press and yet find another series of, of ventures, both here and abroad, that have opened up. Courtney, we're almost out of time, but I want you to look out over the next ten to fifteen years and tell me what you see coming in space commerce. I have a terrible track record at uh, crystal balling. So uh, you can come back to me uh, 
time in 10 years and, and uh, embarrass me all you wish. Um, I think something's going to happen faster than we anticipated and, and some not. So um, I think that um, we'll, we'll get to the moon, not by 24 and probably not by 26 as NASA is expecting, but probably somewhere by the end of the 20s. Um, I give uh, the commercial sector led by SpaceX a fighting chance that they might plant their flag on the moon before NASA does. Um, and in fact, it may well be a NASA a mixed crew with a NASA trained astronaut or perhaps a private trained astronaut on behalf of the government that uh, lands uh, on, uh, as part of that crew on, on the moon. Um, I think that we're gonna begin to see in 10 years breakthrough in terms of some enterprise showing how you can actually make money on a sustained basis in space, in orbit, taking advantage of microgravity. Until today, almost all the work that's gone on in drug testing in space and other types of, of um, materials processing have provided insights that have been useful back on earth. Um, but nobody has said, hey, this breakthrough is so huge that we can develop a, a self-supporting space factory. And I think we'll probably see that in the next uh, 10 years or so. I think there's a good chance that we'll begin to see at least at a beta uh, level um, space hospitals. Arthur Clarke, the, the late and well-known science fiction writer, and of course uh, was the author of Space Odyssey, predicted <clears throat> that uh, in a microgravity environment, people with heart issues and, and others, ailments that are aggravated by uh, gravity would benefit from um, space. I think they're gonna be people in the sports entertainment world. They're gonna find all sorts of opportunities in microgravity for taking variants of today's uh, uh, athletics and um, uh, you know wrestling in in, uh, in 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 micro G and maybe if it's allowed gambling again it's a wild west there, there's really no regulations or laws that, that prohibit uh, gambling on entertainment in space uh, at least for the moment uh, those are random examples um, so I think you begin to see the beginnings of space factories, you begin to see something in the medical field um, that will begin to be these small steps that will uh, contribute to a self-sustaining ecosystem that could possibly lead to um, sustained large-scale communities in space. In the alternative, none of this is guaranteed, it could be in 10 years that we're still seeking those profits, still seeking that revenue. And we end up with isolated remote uh, robotic uh, depots, not dissimilar to what you see in Antarctica today. So those are two paths. I prefer to be the one that envisions a larger uh, migration. I call it the great migration off planet. Um, you haven't asked Tom, but uh, the risk of or, or overstepping the time limit, we need more diversity. Um, and I'm, I'm beginning to see, uh, thankfully, more women getting into uh, the space, commercial space field. Uh, we need more people of color and, and so forth uh, to open up the horizons for uh, humanity at large. Um, and the good news is that I'm beginning to see that uh, take place, not as quickly as I'd like, but surely uh, it, I see signs that it's, that it's happening. So uh, um, you can you see why I stay involved in it for there all these go. years. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Courtney, we could probably talk for another half hour. So I hope you'll come back yes. and join us again on the Xterra podcast. It would be a pleasure. Thank you, sir. I've been talking with Courtney Statt, founder and president of Capital Alliance Solutions on the Xterra podcast. That is going to do it for this edition. You can subscribe to the audio version of the podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, and many other popular podcasting platforms. 
Be sure to click on subscribe to be sure you don't miss an episode of the podcast or any of our other videos. You can also get daily news at XterraJSC.com. And one thing more, be sure to connect with us on LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter at XterraJSC. Until next time, I'm Tom Patton. Thanks for joining us.